Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Lunchtime Topics. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. I'm Kate with the Creative Coast, Director of Programming and Communications here. And if this is your first time watching or listening later on, uh, the Creative Coast is a 501c3 nonprofit here in Savannah, Georgia, and we exist to catalyze the innovation economy here um, on the coast of Georgia, uh, centralized and headquartered in Savannah. And so what Lunchtime Topics is, it's a, um, right now it's a monthly program. We slow down in the summer and we do one a month um, that features an expert in their field who shares their wisdom with our startup and innovative and um, techie community here in Savannah. So each topic is different from um, month to month or topic to topic if we're doing more than one a month. And um, today we have our own Jennifer Bonet. We're excited to have her. She is the executive director here at the Creative Coast, and she's also the vice president of innovation and entrepreneurship at the Savannah Economic Development Authority. So she works two jobs. <laughs> and um, a little bit about Jen, so you can um, get some background on why she is an expert in this topic. She is a um, what she calls a recovering entrepreneur with years of experience as a serial entrepreneur. Um, she's a former technology entrepreneur and she has over 25 years of experience in information technology and software development and specializing in web and mobile technologies. She's held uh, numerous uh, CTO and CEO positions in um, booth, bootstrapped angel and venture backed technology startups. And she's raised over 50 million in angel and venture capital funds across three startups. So. Um, she's got a lot of experience and she's going to be talking about that today in our topic, which is show me the money, um, learn how to raise funds for your business, learn how to raise capital for your business. And she's going to talk about the various uh, avenues you can take to achieve that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her so we can go ahead and get started. Thanks, Jen, for talking today. Thank you for having me. It's, it's good to be back on screen. It's been a while since I've done a lunchtime topic. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. And of course, um, funding strategy is always one of my favorite topics. I like, I, I love this, uh, show me the, show me the money. So um, that the comment from uh, the from a movie, right? But a little bit more about me. So entrepreneur, CTO, co-founded seven companies, raised $52 million over the three companies, three exits. I'm the founder of Startup Ticks. I ran the state of Georgia's technology incubator for about seven years. And then I moved here to Savannah, Georgia to uh, really catalyze this community here. And that uh, right there is a picture of me in People Magazine, uh, circa probably 2001, prior to the dot-com crash. I wrote a search engine and I was um, CTO of the top seven websites in the world. So um, again, we're talking about money today. Just show me the money, Tom, uh, Tom Cruise, right? Um, and, and we're gonna walk through a lot of stuff. So somebody put something in chat. Let me see the service industry planning. Okay, cool. So um, I'm 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 a bad news, good news person. So we're gonna first we're gonna share the bad news is not all ideas get funded, right? So uh, over five hundred thousand companies get started every year. Venture capitalists fund approximately a thousand companies a year. Angel investors, which are high net worth individuals that make investments in companies of their own cash, um, invest in about 30,000 30, companies a year. So less than 6% of all companies that get funded, uh, that get launched every year, get funded, right? Um, you know, so from my perspective, stating that in mind, that's, it's just a statistic, right? You can't control statistics. You can't control history. Uh, on top of that bad news, women get less than 2% of all funding. Female founded companies get less than 2% of all funding and minority uh, fund founded businesses get less than 1% of that type of funding, venture and angel capital, right? So you can't change the stats. All you can do is do the work, right? If you build a great business, you are fundable is the way to think about this. And it's your responsibility to build that business and get it to the stage that it's fundable, right? Plus the other thing that you need to think about is all it takes is one yes. So you might get a thousand no's, but all it takes is one yes. And you're looking for the right yes, right? Um, the wrong yes 
uh, is very painful, right? So you want a good strategic, if you're seeking investment, you want a good strategic investor, somebody that understands the business that you're in and can add value beyond the money. There really is no such thing as a passive investor, right? There is no such thing. You don't really want a passive investor, but there really is no such thing as a passive investor. If somebody writes you a check, they want, they're gonna keep in touch with you and they're gonna wanna know that they made a good investment and that they're gonna get their money back, right? So we go back to this concept that not all ideas are fund funded. So that breaks down into two different questions that you can ask yourself, right? Is the idea fundable is the first question. And then the second one is, are you fundable, right? Okay, so first we're gonna talk about is the idea fundable, right? Is the idea fun? This is doing your homework. This is doing at least your business model canvas. This is like getting out the door, understanding who your customer is, building out your business financial model, um, building, you know, understanding that they're, you know, doing your customer discovery, doing your financial literacy, as I call it, you know, being able to get to the point that you can show through a set of interviews. Uh, hypotheses and tests, minimal wild products, that there really truly is a market for what you're trying to do and that it is a financially viable, sustainable uh, market at that, right? And so first things first, know your business, right? So this is the business model canvas. If you're not familiar with it, it's kind of a bullet point business plan. So instead of spending a month writing a business plan, it's like, let's put it all in bullet points, right? Um, Youth in our community, okay. Um, so know your business, know who your customers are, who your customer segments are, know your value propositions to those customers, understand the financial model, both the cost stru structure and the revenues, right? Understand your relationships, understand your channels, right? Second component is knowing your market, right? How big is the market? Who are your competitors? How are you better or different? This comes back to value proposition again, right? So know your market, right, is the next piece of knowing your business, right? The third component is know the investors, okay? Investors invest in people and things that they understand and know. So if you're in a, uh, a certain type of industry, investors tend to invest in an industry that they know. That's why real estate investors usually only invest in real estate because they know the real estate invest industry, right? They don't know the tech industry. If you know the tech industry, you might not invest in real estate, right? So when you're looking for investors, you're looking for investors that know and understand your business, that know and understand your industry and can hopefully open the door to uh, people in their Rolodex that might be valued partners for you um, in, your, in your business, right? And it used to be really, really hard to get to know investors. But now um, social media and things like LinkedIn, tools like LinkedIn have made it so much easier. Um, um, also some specialty li lists, uh, tools like Crunchbase and AngelList ha have identified places where you can actually just go and type in an angel's name and find out who they've invested in, in the past. Uh, or you can type in a competitor company name into crunchbase.com and find who's invested in that. So, um, you know, it's, it's really important to dig in and know your investors. And again, investors invest in what they know, right? Um, I'm going to tell a story here about a, a, a woman that I coached because it's it's important to to know that um, what they know might be different than what you think they know. Um, and so uh, years ago, probably probably ten years ago at this point, I was coaching uh, with startup chicks. We were in the middle of our accelerator program, and I had a woman that was building a platform for uh, kind of a learning management system on top of the iPad for children with autism. And she, she got an, uh, a meeting with a very well-known tech investor in Atlanta um, who is known for mostly growth stage companies. So that is kind of a little bit later on 
Uh, she was still very early stage. She was still building out the product. She didn't have any customers yet, but she got a meeting with him and she was so excited to have this meeting with him. And I, I was went in with tempered uh, kind of response was like, okay, you know, just so you know, he usually invests later, you know, he's also, you know, he's very aggressive with his investment and how, how much equity he wants in the company. So the terms may not be favorable, whatnot, and trying to temper, temper the, um, the response or, or her expectations about the meeting because I didn't want her to go in and just get crushed. And uh, she came out with a check and um, she came out and I was really surprised. She came out with a check from him personally as an angel investor instead of the firm that he runs. Uh, but she still got a sizable investment from him. And, you know, when we got into the conversation and really discussing it afterwards and, and like kind of doing a postmortem on the meeting, it turned out that his son has uh, is on the autism spectrum. So he understood the problem at a level that most people don't understand. And so despite the fact that, you know, he normally invests in a different type of technology at a later stage, he understood this problem that this woman, my, my startup chick was trying to solve. And, and he, he knew that. He, he understood the problem because he had a son in that situation and he invested in that company because okay. of that. So um, I didn't know that he had a son with autism. Apparently my startup chick did. Um, she, had, she had connected with him on Facebook and found out that he had a child on the autism spectrum and, and went after it and got money from him because of that. And so just a like kind of example of how you might be, if you do the research, you find investors in your, in your local area, and then you do a deep dive into what those people invest in through their websites, through their blogs, and through their social media, um, and find out what their interests are, you might be able to get uh, uh, an investment from those folks. Okay. So now that we've given a little bit of thought to, uh, uh, to, to, um, okay, I guess the last piece here in knowing whether or not your idea is fundable is you have to put together your toolkit. Too many people come to me and say, I'm meeting with an investor and they don't have their toolkit in place, right? And your toolkit is these three things, physical things that you have to work on and have prepared. And hopefully other people have reviewed them and red penned them, right? And that is the one pager which is on the far right, the executive summary, the one pager, right? That's a one page overview of your business. And it's a, all of those topics have to be covered there. So um, we, we have one available for download. And when we teach the Idea Accelerator Bootcamp, we go into great detail on that. The, the middle column is your financial model. So what does your five-year financial plan look like? Your model, right? How, how much revenue are you gonna produce this year and next year and the following year? And what assumptions are you making behind those revenue numbers and those expense numbers, right? And the last is your pitch deck, right? So your uh, PowerPoint presentation that is either one that you're going to give in person or one that you're gonna use as a leave behind um, after a meeting. Those are your toolkits. So that is part of the homework around your idea, valid, getting, you know, getting to the point that your idea is investable, right? So then comes the next question, are you fundable, right? So here's the really cool thing. First time founders, founders get funded every day. So if you've never, if you've never raised money before, right, you, you're not out of the game, right? It is easier for a second or third time founder that has raised money in the past to raise money again, because they go back to the people that invested in them last time. Hopefully they had a good relationship and they made that person a lot of money or that company a lot of money. And so, so then they have that path forward. Um, but first time founders get funded every day. And when you go and talk to an investor and you ask why, you know, how do you make a decision to invest in a founder? These are the types of things that are gonna come back. They were super passionate, you know, they were persistent. Like they met with me for once a month for six months or, or reached out to me once a month for six months, giving me an update um, prior to me making the decision to fund them, right? You know, that they were willing to do the work. Um, 
and and in my bit, my bit case, a lot of times I'll meet with an entrepreneur and I say, okay, your homework is to do the one pager. Here's the here's the template. Here's a template of a one pager. We can't meet until you do the one pager. They will come back to me two or three weeks later and want to meet and again ask me how to get funded, but they won't have done the one pager, right? You got to do the work, right? So in this case, the work is you know getting the business off the ground, preparing yourself, building those tools out trying to get into some customers, right? You gotta be willing to do the work. Nobody's gonna write you a check before you do the work, right? Are you coachable, right? So nobody wants to give advice to somebody that never takes their advice, right? So nobody, you know, so how open are you to the investor's thoughts, right? Um, ultimately, it's your decision, it's your business, but if somebody invests in you, they do expect to be heard, right? And they do expect to have, uh, be able to be, to, to give an opinion, to be heard, and to have that opinion at least thought through, right? Um, and that's what I mean by coachable, right? Then do, do, does the investor think that you have the, the ability to actually truly build out your vision, right? you've probably got a really big vision, right? Can you build out the vision? Can you really do it, right? Is it too big? Is it too small? Are you the right person to do it, right? And then the last one is, can you build out a team to execute on your vision, right? Uh, investment firms and angels rarely invest in solo founders without a team. And they do that for the simple fact that if you're a solo founder and you don't have a team and they give you, I don't know, $250,000 and you get hit by a bus, what happens to their $250,000 investment? I know that sounds a little harsh, but it could happen. And that's how they think, right? So they want a team. They want to know that if something happens, if you got COVID and we're in the hospital for three, three weeks a year ago, what would have happened to your business? It needs to keep going if you've taken outside capital. It can't stop. Um, so these are things that you control. You can be passionate. You can be persistent. You need to do the work. You can work on being coachable and taking like taking feedback, right? You can build a team. These are things that are in your control, right? So if you can put together the tools and your idea is fundable, right, based on the tools that you've put together and the research that you've done around your business, right, and you're that passionate, persistent person willing to take feedback that's going to build a team and build something big, then you can raise funds, okay? So now we're through that. Yes, you can raise money. There's two types of money. There's your your money, other people's money, okay? Okay. Um, you're always gonna to have to invest at least your time, if not your money. Investors are gonna look for, to make sure that you've made some sort of investment in this business before they're willing to invest. So you have to invest some of your time and money to get to the point where you can raise other, people money, other people's money. But for the rest of the time, we're gonna just focus on other people's money, okay? So other people's money, right? There's kind of four different kinds right? There's revenue, right? So you get customers, they pay you money to do that service or to use your tool or product. That is other people's money coming into our business as revenue. That is the best kind of other people's money to get, right? There is debt, right? Your tr traditional bank loan, right? Or, or debt note. Right, you can do a debt note. Uh, you can you can get a loan from a friend to launch your business, um, and that is debt that's going to be paid back. Right. Um, okay. Equity. Equity is when you sell a percentage of your company for an amount of money. Okay. Uh, and we're going to go into equity last. And there's a couple, I've got a bunch of slides at the end around equity. And then convertible note is both debt and equity. Okay, a convertible note is a debt note that at some later date 
or activity transitions to equity. Okay, so it's it's a little bit of both. And it's you might hear the term safe note, which is popular in the venture capital and angel world. Um, and that refers to a convertible note that, that is a, a, a debt note, which is basically, hey, we're loaning you $100,000, but at some point when you raise your next round, that's gonna convert to equity at this rate. Um, and that, that's one of the things, okay. All right, so when you start thinking about other people's money, we start thinking about how to fund our idea, one of the keys is what stage are you in, um, right? And so are you at the seed or startup stage? And I'm going to call the seed or startup stage right now less than 25 paying customers. So if you have less than 25 paying customers, this is your path to getting some funding for your business, right? You're going to self-fund. You're going to extend your runway. You're going to get money from friends and family. You're going to use pitch competitions. You're going to do crowdfunding. You're going to do grants. You're going to do customer prepayment or SBA loan programs, okay? I'm going to go through each one real quick. Okay, self-fund. 82% of all entrepreneurs use their own savings to fund their business. That could be savings, home equity lines, borrowing from retirement funds and credit card debt. Um, just, just the honest, hard truth is you're going to have to pull some funding into the business yourself, right? Extending your runway. Um, this is a lot easier than it used to be, but this is how do you pull money from a, I like to say, um, kind of a less brain-powered task to fund the brain-powered business that you want to have. So back in the day, there was no gigs, right? But now we got Uber, we got Lyft, we got Instacart, we got DoorDash, Uber Eats, Postmate. You've got Airbnb, you could run out of room on Airbnb. Um, what we're looking for is some sort of flexible job that allows you to earn some cash while diverting your brain to your business. So you want to put most of your brain power towards your business. So you want to try and get something going on that, that pays enough for you to kind of get the business off the ground. When I launched my first business in 1997, so I just dated myself a long time ago, this didn't exist. I rented a room. I sold my Mercedes and bought a used Volkswagen. And what else did I do? There was one other thing. Oh, I had saved. I, well, A, I'd saved up vacation for years. I knew I was gonna do this startup eventually. So I had like a month and a half of vacation saved up. So I got paid for that vacation time when I left that job. Um, I, I worked nights and weekends on the startup for over a year before I went full-time on it. Um, I, again, rented the room. I was able to rent the room in my condo at such a price that it basically paid my mortgage. And, and you know, I had saved and I had prepped. So I, I was ready to do it. And, and I'll be, so I extended my runway, my personal financial runway of how long I could work in that business to get off the ground uh, to the point that it could afford to truly pay me a decent salary by extending my runway. And I've done it multiple times that way. Friends and family. Okay, there's friends and family you can take uh, a loan from or you can uh, uh, choose to sell them a stake in your company, equity. Um, it can be awkward and it can be tricky. Um, my family has always invested in my, bu my businesses. Um, they've gotten returns on investment at least twice. One time they didn't. Um, you need to make it a business transaction. You need to explain the risks. Do not take any money they aren't willing to lose. Uh, you need to do proper documentation. You need to hire an attorney, execute appropriate paperwork. If you're doing it as a loan, there's some new loan uh, solutions online. I just did a, a loan to a, a small business entrepreneur through something called Pigeon Loans. Um, so we were able to do the whole document online where it says, this is how much I'm lending you. This is how much uh, interest you're going to pay. And this is when I'm expecting to get it back and how you're, when you're going to start making payments on it all through this online platform. So if you're dealing with friends and family, you're going to take money from them. Make sure it's a business transaction. Make sure you do the legal appropriate way. Um, and then make sure that you keep them informed of what's going on in the business. And I try and say, like, let's separate those conversations from the family time, right? So um, 
in the past when I took money from my family, they got the investor newsletter that I sent out every month with the updates, just like my normal investors. And if they wanted to have a conversation about the business, it wasn't going to happen at Thanksgiving dinner. Like they, we would schedule some other time to do it. And, and that oftentimes made, took me taking a hard line with them and saying, Hey, you know, let's not a it's not really appropriate to discuss at the dinner table. Can we talk about that some other time when other folks aren't around? So it's awkward, it's tricky, but I will tell you that for my very first startup, my co-founders and I, there were four of us, raised $400,000 in friends and family money. So that's how we got the business off the ground the first time. Pitch and or business plan competitions. Okay, this is a really great opportunity for women and minority entrepreneurs, especially now. Um, people want to see women doing big things and winning at it. So um, here's the thing, only a small percentage win, right? So um, a, a, a group like uh, Venture Atlanta, which will be in October, that's looking for applications right now to get pitch and get on stage, right? Um, they actually don't have any cash involved, so that's probably a bad example. But um, the night before that will be the Atlanta startup battle. They give away $100,000 they will go through probably a thousand applications. About 20 of those applications will make it to a mentorship day. About 20 of the, uh, out of the 25 will be picked to pitch on stage and one winner will get $100,000. So the question becomes, can you win? And is it, and unless you're absolutely positive, is it worth the prep time and mental emotional bandwidth to pursue this option as a, as a funding strategy? Okay, that, all that being said, a little negative there, that being said, um, Part Pick, a uh, company I worked with, a uh, startup tech company I worked with in Atlanta, um, had a tremendously well-spoken uh, Black female founder, Joel Burke Solomon, and she raised over $1.2 million through pitch competitions, right? Um, so you can raise a lot of money through pitch competitions if you can win it. So uh, it kind of depends on your skill set, but it's it's certainly an opportunity. Crowdfunding, um, and we're this is crowdfunding for uh, not for equity, really. This is crowdfunding for for cash, and this is really great for physical products, social impact companies, um, anything where you want to get um, kind of. It's a pre-sale is the way to think about it, right? So you're going to put something out there and you're going to say, hey, we're, we're building this company. It's going to do this. So we're building this product and it's going to do this. We need your help. Can you pre-purchase it? And, and then you'll be the first to get the, the product. Uh, it's really great. There's pl platforms that are focused just on female entrepreneurs and whatnot. There's lots of different options. It's, it's a really good way to not only raise funds, but to actually validate the market. Right. So if somebody's willing to prepay for your product three months before they're going to get it, that's pretty indicate pretty good indication that you've got a good market there. So um, crowdfunding versus via presale is a great option for certain types of businesses. Grants. Grants are awesome if you can get them because they're non-dilutive funding. You do not need to pay grants back. Right. And there's kind of two types. There's uh, ones from foundations or there's ones from research, right? So great, great access. Um, the foundation grants work best for businesses with a social spend for good for profit. So I know, I know uh, somebody said that they wanted to uh, work in the youth space in the chat. A foundational grant might be an amazing way for you to fund some of the business, especially at the beginning, right? Because you find a foundation that's interested in, in supporting youth, and now you can go after that grant money and, and get some grant money to get off the ground. Uh, the research grants are run through federal programs called the SBIR and STTR grants, and they do require both scientific talent and true intellectual property to be developed. So there's actual research going on here. But pretty much every governmental agency uh, will put out a post on a website, grants.gov, and you can go search that um, database. Anybody can search that database, and you can find out what kind of research they're looking for. 
And so uh, a couple of years ago, I, I got a grant, um, actually Creative Coast got a grant um, for um, actually creating a seed fund. And that actually came through grants.gov. So um, I check out grants.gov, but it could be things like um, entrepreneurial education or an education platform um, for uh, healthcare. Um, healthcare's got huge, huge numbers of grants out there. The uh, NIH, National Institution of Health, has a ton of grants. So if you're in the healthcare space, there might be an ability to get some SBIR, STTR funding. And that comes in, a, in phases. So I think the entry phase starts at like 50K, but over the life of, of it, you can get two to $10 million through that program. Um, and then the America Recovery Act has a bunch of stuff out there for uh, grant money. Um, this, this is the COVID funds, right? And, and, you know, there was the PPP and idle loans that came out up front, which were great for small businesses that were actually already running. But some of this Recovery Act money has been set aside. Um, it's mostly distributed through the state and then the cities. And, and those cities, different cities, um, if you pay attention to this stuff online, you're going to see all different cities doing announcements about they have grant funding for minority or female-owned businesses or veteran-owned businesses that is part of their American Recovery Act. So each city is responsible. Each The money comes to the state, the state divvies it up amongst the cities, and then each city has its own, uh, has to have its own mechanism for getting the funds out into the city. Um, and, and a lot of the money is, is, is focused around uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives, female founders, and, and then um, uh, veteran-owned businesses. So uh, you should be uh, kind of keeping your eye on uh, what's going on in Chatham County around that type of funding. My personal favorite way to raise money to get my business off the ground is a prepayment from a customer, B2B, business to business, customer prepayment. I call it customer-funded development. Um, this is when you have an idea for a company, an app, a service, and you go get the customer before you build the solution. It, it, it's, it shows that the, uh, it would show other investors that there's a customer that's so anxious for this product or service that they were willing to pay up front for it. And then you use the money that they pay you for that product or service to actually build the product. So this is my favorite. Um, but it's a, in fact, I've done it on three or four companies. So it's, it's absolutely doable and it's one of my favorites. And, and you oftentimes these come to you in the customer discovery process, which again, if you don't really understand customer discovery, you might want to check out our Idea Accelerator Bootcamp. We'll be running it again in the fall. We just wrapped it in May, but we'll be running it again in the fall. It's a 12-week program on how to take your company from idea stage to, uh, to, to getting going, accelerate it. Hmm. Um, commercial banks and SBA loans, right? So uh, this would be like a standard commercial bank. They're going to typically look for a three to five years history at a, at a uh, at a standard bank, but um, when you're talking to your banker, you're gonna to wanna to ask about SBA loans. SBA loans are guaranteed by the SBA, and so they're typically easier to get. And there's about 11 different types of SBA affiliated loans that you can get. And the, you know, a micro loan starts at something like 10 to 50K, and, you know, I, honestly, I got a, I, we helped a, mic, a, a SCAD student that was launching a business get a micro loan of 10K to get his business off the ground. And obviously he didn't have a whole lot of experience because he was a SCAD student. So they are, uh, they are accessible. Um, something that uh, the, the different type of SBA loans become really obvious of, as to what type you should get based on the dollar amount and the type of business that you have, how long you've been in business. Um, eight, one of the interesting things that I found when I was doing research on this is that 80% of all successful loan applications come from one or two banks in our region, in every region in the state. And so in Savannah, um, our, our partner, the SBAC, um, located on Liberty Street, is, is probably one of the best bets. And so that's, that's where I would start if this is the type of funding. 
Uh, this month, this works really well for physical locations and, you, and when you have a really under, a well understood business model. Awesome. And then um, now we're gonna move into other types, growth or expansion stage funding. And what, again, I put early in seed stage as 25 or less customers, right? So once you start to the point where you know that you have product market fit, you have some paying customers and you're ready to scale and grow, all of those options from the early stage are still available to you. But in addition, you have uh, other mechanisms available to basically uh, grow your business, right? So commercial bank loans, same as last time. We'll have non-traditional loans, supplier financing, purchase order financing, royalty-based financing, leasing and licensing, and then equity funding. Okay, and I gotta speed it up here, so I apologize. Um, non-traditional loans, right? So there's all different types of new funding options um, that are, are opening up that look at uh, business performance as a versus just a credit score. So amazon.com has its own funding mechanism. Cabbage is a company out of Atlanta that I worked with a lot that does uh, kind of funding with a different model. Um, Fundbox is one that I'm actually uh, have reached out to and the Creative Coast is hoping to work with in the, in, in the not too distant future as a partner, fundbox.com. And then of course, PayPal. Um, Supplier financing. This is when your supplier gives you terms so you can purchase and sell the product before you paid for them. So say you're selling on Amazon and you have to, um, well, maybe that's not a good example. If you're selling, if you're like a, a selling a physical product and say you even have a store in downtown Savannah, right? If you can buy the product from the supplier negotiate a net 90 day payment or even net 30 day payment. That's when you're gonna owe the supplier 30 days after you receive the item and you can sell within those 30 days or within those 90 days, then the supplier has essentially financed your sale because you were able to sell the product in a shorter period of time than it was due for uh, uh, actually um, when you owed the money to the supplier, right? So this works really well kind of in the drop shipping industry or in industries that you have relationships where you can negotiate a longer uh, term, payment term with your supplier. B2B purchase order financing. Okay, so uh, I mentioned Fundbox earlier. This is one of the services that they have. Now Corporation, friends of mine of Atlanta have been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is when you're selling to a, another business and, and you're delivering services and there's a time frame before they're paying you money, you can actually sell that purchase order to another company like now, and then they will collect on that purchase order and you'll get cash up front and they'll take a percentage off of the top, but uh, you'll get your cash today and you won't have to worry about collecting from that customer later because they'll do it for you. Royalty-based financing, right? This is Mr. Wonderful on, Star, uh, on, 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 on Shark Tank's favorite thing, right? He gives you a loan, right? And you pay it off with a percentage of revenue up until you've paid off that loan and, and a certain length time beyond that. So he gets his return on investment, right? So um, that's, that's an interesting option for funding once you have customers and things like that. Leasing and licensing fees, right? Works best for businesses with some sort of asset, right? So like the NBA store, like, right? They have all those logos that they have assets to. So, you know, you can, I have a friend that runs um, the ornament store, the Christmas store down on River Street, right? And they pay a huge fee to uh, the NCAA to be able to print ornaments with all the different logos from all the different football teams, right? And so that's a mechanism for the NCA to make money by licensing that, by, by paying for that. And so if your business develops a brand or an asset that might be worth licensing to other companies, you can make money off of that. Um, I also have a friend that's uh, moving to Savannah pretty soon 
that is that had the foresight to go and buy hundreds, if not thousands of domain names back in the day. And one of the way he makes money is he leases out those domain names. So he doesn't build a website on them. People approach him and say they want to buy the website, the domain name. He says, no, but I'll lease it to you for 20 bucks a month or hundred dollars a month or whatever. And he makes money leasing those domain names that he owns, that he purchased and somebody else builds a website on top of it. And he just collects money from them every month. Okay. Another, another innovative idea there. Equity funding. Okay. So this is what probably a lot of you are here for. So we're going to talk about equity funding, right? So equity funding, a couple of key things here is when you're selling a percentage of your company, right? So you are giving up, I don't know, eight, 10, 30% of your company to an investor for money, right? So that you can grow your company and they are expecting a return on their investment when the company has an exit event. Okay, a couple of things. You have to be willing to give up the equity in your company up front, which a lot of people say no to, right? What, when I start explaining that equity is selling a percentage of your company um, and essentially those people get board seats and get votes and get to make key decisions with you, a lot of people say, nope, not interested right there, right? Okay, so that's a key thing that you need to understand if you're thinking, if, if you're, you know, if you're gonna raise money from equity investors, they own a percentage of your company. They get votes, they get things like that, right? The other thing is that they are expecting an exit event. That means they are expecting you to sell your business in the future such that you're, there's a return on their investment. They get more money back that they, than they invested when you sell your company, right? And there's lots of people that come to me and say, well, I never wanna sell my business. Well, then you can't take equity funding. You gotta find another source of funding, right? because this is the intent. And we're talking, you know, 10 to 100 times multiples, right? So um, people want a significant, you know, percentage when they're taking a, a return when they're taking equity funding, okay? There are kind of, um, when you think of equity funding, we had the friends and family round. We talked about that a little bit earlier. That could be debt, that could be equity. In this case, we're talking equity. That's for early stage. So at the concept idea stage or prototype stage, you're probably going after friends and family round, or right? And you might be going after some grants, some angels and some angel groups, right? All the way through product stage. So you're building a product and you're taking it to market. Venture capital tends to play in the product and really growth stage funding. They want you to have proven that there is actually a market for your product before they invest in you. So you have to have some customers, right? And then when a, a company is mature, it's mostly looking at private equity, banks, or going public. So that's kind of a cool chart that explains, how, depending on what stage your company is at, what kind of equity funding is available to you. Um, okay, so uh, accelerator programs are a great way to get some funding that is equity based, right? Um, and so that would be uh, Techstars or Y Combinator, or uh, we're launching one related to supply chain right here in Savannah, Georgia next week um, called, called uh, Plug and Play, Plug and Play Savannah. Right, and um, so Plug and Play Savannah, uh, Plug and Play Ventures, a West Coast uh, company that's opening an office here in Savannah has gone through hundreds of applications to vet 20 companies that are coming here next week to present to the partners and 10 companies will get in. And then they'll get an opportunity to work with these companies and potentially get some uh, funding on the back end, right? Uh, some of these accelerator programs are focused on industries, which ours is, it's supply chain and logistics here in Savannah, Georgia, but others are, are open, are more open than that. So this is kind of similar to pitch competitions as far as a funding strategy. You know, a Y Combinator or a Techstars type of program will typically give you about 150K if you get in, and they're going to expect six to 8% of your company, Right. Uh, so the question is, is it worth applying? Because hundreds or thousands of people might apply. 20 get invited to the demo like pitch day. At that pitch day, 10 companies get selected to get into the program. So can you get in, right? And then is it worth the prep time? 
So same type of conversation. Again, great opportunity for, for me, female and minority entrepreneurs. Um, the money that you get from these accelerator programs is typically a convertible note, what is called a safe note. Equity funding, uh, equity crowdfunding via the JOB Act, right? So we talked a little bit about equity as a pre-sale for a product company through a Kickstarter. There are also these companies, Angelus, Seed Invest Fundable, or three of them where you can sell a percentage of your company uh, for, through, on their platforms, right? You're selling a percentage of the company, you're registering with the F SEC in order to do so. So there's a lot of rules when you sell equity in your company that you have to follow, right? And there's still a lot of of, of options here. So that is, um, in fact, you can register your company if you're looking for money uh, on AngelList, but still not take any money through, money through that platform, but um, they've really become a funding platform. And so this is, these are online sources that are helping you sell percentages of your company uh, equity in your company that you can go online and register for, and you can upload your pitch deck, and then um, they'll make the connection to, to investors um, and, and manage a lot of that process for you. Angel funding, okay. So angels are accredited high net worth individuals, which means that they make either $250,000 a year or have a net worth of over a million dollars that does not include the value of their home. So these are high people that make a lot of money, right? Um, a key here is angel investors invest their own money, right? Um, and they, they do invest in a lot of companies, right? And they invest not only in tech startups, but they, uh, you could find an angel here that we might invest in your restaurant, right? Um, so they do invest in all different types of businesses. Again, it's going to come back to their preference. What industries do they know? How can they add value? Um, right. How can there, but, but again, you are selling a percentage of your cut company, right? You do need to register with the SEC and do this the legal way, right? It can be straight equity or could be a convertible note. And angels are seeking a return on investment, but many angels are also seeking to be engaged and involved in the company, right? They, they, they're part of the reason they're there is that they, they, they want to give back to, they want to be active and participate. Um, so part, you know, again, key, these are individuals, high net worth individuals that are contributing their own money toward your business, right? And, and typically want to be involved. Again, I said earlier, there's really is no passive investor. They typically want to be involved somehow in helping you grow your business, okay? And then lastly, we have venture funding, okay? Venture companies are, they're money managers, right? So these venture firms have a team of people that go out and raise money from what they call limited partners, right? and then they invest other people's money, right? So there's actually, this number is probably a little bit low because they've the number of VCs that have blown up over the last year alone is, is kind of crazy. There's probably over 500 active VCs. They invest in four to 5,000 companies a year. Um, you are definitely selling a percentage of their company. You're definitely registering with the SAC. It's more likely to be equity than a convertible note. Some venture capital firms will do convertible notes at a very early stage, but they typically prefer equity um, to, to a, a percentage of your company. Um, and again, these people are, are money managers, right? So they're expecting to get a very high return on investment for their customers. All right, so those are kind of the different types of funding. So how do you find investors, right? So angel groups, there are angel groups. In fact, there is one here in town. It's called the Ariel Southeast Angel Forum. Ariel Southeast Angel, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. It's a P, ASAP, right? Ariel Southeast Angel Partner. Partner. Partners, maybe, um, but the, so there's angel groups all over. Uh, Venture South is one that's kind of all over the South, and they they actually have a, a office in Bluffton, or they they have a not an office, it's not a formal office, but a, a member in Bluffton that gets people together. There's so there's all different sorts of angel groups that you can look up. Um, great way to meet investors is at conferences and events that cater towards showcasing those uh, startups. 
incubators and accelerators, right? And then online, AngelList, Crunchbase, Seed Invest, and PitchBook. Um, the key here, again, I'm gonna take it back home, right? Investors, even investors that are VCs, at the end of the day, people invest in what they know and industries that they know. And they invest in people that they like working with, which is why the coachable thing is important when you're thinking about you seeking investment capital, that you need to be willing to be coachable and listen and learn. I see there's a question, so I'm gonna see if I can see what it is. Yes, the recording will go out. Yes, definitely. Um, and then courting investors. Okay, so now you've found some investors. Um, when you meet an investor, you wanna be in control, right? So I don't know how many times I've gone to an event, an investor related event, and one of the entrepreneurs I've been coaching comes back to me and says, hey, I met with so-and-so. They're, they're like an amazing investor and they're so great. And they, they listened to me for a half an hour and, and they asked for my card and they said that, you know, and, and so I know they're really interested. I'm going to put them on my list as a hot, hot investor lead. And I said, great. So you got their card. And the answer is no, I gave them my card. Okay. Yeah. As the entrepreneur, you want the ball in your court. So if you're making a sale to an investor, to, to, to a company, you want to always be the person that holds the ball, right? So you want their card. You want to understand how they uh, want to communicate. Do they want an email? Do they, would they rather have a text or a call? Um, ask for permission to keep in touch. Email them every month. Tell them bad news in your monthly update. Okay. Ask for advice, right? And, and be ready for when they want to talk, start talking about investment. It may take three months, it may take six months. The reason you want to share bad news is it goes back to that coachable component. Like if you only share good news all the time, then if you have to share really bad news once they're actually invested in your company, the, they might get blindsided by it, right? But if you, if you share bad news all the time, um, like, hey, we lost a customer or, hey, we thought we were going to hire this really great person and they decided to go for somebody else that we can't afford. So we're back to the drawing board looking for this person. You can turn that into your ask, right? Oh, we lost this great candidate. We thought they were going to take this really key job. Unfortunately, we couldn't match the price that one of our competitors offered to them. We lost them. So this is the, you know, that's the bad news you're sharing now. Then be like, hey, so if anybody knows anybody that would be a great fit for that role, that key role, please let us know. That's then you've just asked for your advice or your help, right? Um, if they're not a fit, if they just say like when you meet with them, hey, we don't invest in that or, or, or you're, you're not a fit for our investment thesis, that's when you can ask for a warm intro. Great, awesome, really good to know. I appreciate that you're not a fit. Do you know anybody who might be? Okay, so there's another question. Okay. Um, all right, closing investors. All right, there's a process, right? You meet an investor, you kind of court the investor, you date the investor, you're sending them emails or doing phone calls or coffee meetings, right? Eventually it comes to a close, right? You've got to, you know, uh, if they say, if you're able to convert them to, hey, let's have a conversation about what, you know, what, what you're looking for. We want to move forward possibly with an investment, right? You need a lead investor. So if you're raising venture or angel capital, you typically need a lead investor. You need somebody to, to say, I'm in and here are the terms, right? And that's where the next bullet point comes in. There's going to be either a term sheet or a private placement memorandum. A term sheet is an investor driven document that they give you as the lead investor that says, here are the terms by which I'm willing to invest in your company. If you don't want to live with somebody else's terms, then you take the, the legal action up front of creating a document with your lawyer called a private placement memorandum, which outlines the terms that you are willing to accept and you give that to investors. Once you have a signed term sheet or a signed private placement memorandum, then you're going to go into a process called due diligence. Due diligence is a proctology exam for your business. Uh, and they're gonna look at everything possible. And then eventually you'll come to a close. A close will mean that you're signing legal documents that turn over that equity to that company that's, that's investing into you and, and a wire transfer into your bank account. 
Um, and so this process from lead investor to close can take multiple months as well. So just giving you a timeline perspective, you know, these things looking for investors are, are not, this is not an overnight thing. If you need money now, that's not, this is not the solution. You should be thinking about building relationships with investors at least six months before you need the money.